Okay. Now I see that everybody's starting to look a little more comfortable, taking their ease. That's really good. Very good to see. Okay. Some people have pulled out their, their hats. <laughs> you brought in the warmth. Um, it got a little warmer since, since these guys arrived. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, tonight. So, tonight will be about tending the inner garden. Um, I think so much of what we do uh, in meditation is really close to gardening, basically. Uh, I, uh, I guess I would like to open this with a, with a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, who was asked, uh, what's the point of walking meditation and why do I practice sitting meditation? And he said, because I like it. <laughs> there is no point to these practices to these practices if you don't enjoy them. It's not hard labor. Every breath can bring us peace, joy, and freedom. And of course, I really like this, this quote. Um, but I think that's uh, really, um, it's really good to keep in mind, like, why, why do we do this? Uh, what's, what's the point of our practice? What's the point of meditation? For me, the point of meditation is clearly um, to, be, to be happy because uh, this meditation is fun, it's enjoyable, and it allows us to tap into a kind of happiness that is always there, that is free, and that is self-generated. We don't need anything else to actually enjoy that. And tonight, um, this is a bit of a talk uh, to unpack a little bit more about the six R's, what is right effort, the two wings of awakening, and um, giving you a little bit more, a little bit more material around, around those things, and uh, giving you uh, sutta, sutta references. Uh, I do realize that some of you might not be familiar with uh, everything that I'm saying, so I just want to clarify that um, when I use the, the word, this word quite a lot, sutta, which means uh, the original uh, teachings of the Buddha as they were preserved in the Pali Canon. Of course, there are many traditions that preserve the, the words of the Buddha, like in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, I think it's called Kagyu. Kagyu? No. Kagyu, yeah, right? Oh, good. Yes. And the commentaries, and yes, uh -huh, yes, very large body of text. In early Buddhism, or what is called Theravada Buddhism, uh, it is called as a body of text that is called the Pali Canon, because it is preserved in a language called Pali, which, I mean, there's a... There's a lot to say about this, but I'm not going to dive into the, <laughs> the, whole, uh, the whole story. Uh, but was probably one of the closest things that we still have today to the original language of the Buddha. Um, and these suttas that I'm reading to you uh, on this retreat are, are all my own translations, and they are from the original Pali, basically. So... Um, without diving too much into, into the complexity of that, uh, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows what I'm talking about when I'm referring to the discourses of the Buddha and the suttas. Um, nowadays what happens is that um, we, we get, uh, there's, with the exploding of media and communication, there, there's been also an exploding of uh, different uh, uh, views and modalities around uh, the practice and what the Buddha taught. Uh, I really like this this website that is called uh, Fake Buddha Quotes, <laughs> which uh, is full of fake Buddha quotes. <laughs> 
it's all really good. It sounds really spiritual and all this, and it's 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 good. Like the, all of these quotes are usually actually pretty good, but they're not really from the Buddha. <laughs> And uh, th that's one of the things that's happening nowadays is that it's just like, um, you know, there's a, a, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, misinformation that can happen uh, because of what the, the medias that we're using today and the, the amount of um, what that generates in itself. Having said that, um, I basically, um, I was, uh, before I... Before I ordained my last job, uh, I was a market gardener. So I was working as an organic uh, farmer, um, like farmer's market gardener uh, for a few years. Uh, last job was uh, on a really big organic greenhouse in Eastern Canada. And um, so much of this practice reminds me of gardening because uh, we're cultivating wholesome states and abandoning unwholesome ones that are hurtful and unbeneficial. It's, it's really just like weeding a garden and planting uh, crops that you want to harvest that will nourish you, basically. But to do that, uh, we, need, we need some knowledge. We need, to, we need to be good gardeners. We need to know what we're doing a little bit. I, I remember times uh, <laughs> in the in this big greenhouse where it was really productive. Um, it was an amazing project. It was quite a contraption. Uh, it was about 3.45 acres of covered, heated crops. Uh, in Eastern Canada, where I'm from, um, it gets to minus 30 <laughs> in the winter. And we, are, we were still growing uh, tomatoes and cucumbers. And uh, yeah, so it's... Uh, just a blizzard outside and it's almost like minus 30 and uh, we're growing tomatoes. And so I remember planting uh, seeds in the propagation room and uh, filling up my trays. You know, we have these trays and uh, not really knowing what I was doing. I mean, I was uh, experimenting and uh, I learned I learned a lot, and I learned the hard way, I guess, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, how to grow seeds. And seeds, at the, ver at the very beginning, seeds need a lot of water. So growing seeds, um, seeds need a lot of water at the beginning. It's like they really need to soak up a lot of, uh, of life, a lot of water, and they don't do much. They just kind of get ready, and it takes a while. Uh, and if you don't water them constantly, like two or three times a day, they're not actually going to grow. Uh, they're likely to dry up and uh, the process won't uh, get started very quickly. So that's one thing that I've learned. Um, I, I would uh, maybe not water them enough and then uh, I would have like uh, maybe 30% success rate. <laughs> A little bit would come up, but not that many. And then I figured that I needed to water them a lot, like a lot, a lot, like drench them, soaked, and like two, three times a day. And then they would start to grow. Then I was just continuing like that, and I would just like drench them all the time. And I was like, that's how it's going to grow. And then they all molded. <laughs> <laughs> then fungus got in the, into them. They all started to rot, and they started to mold. Uh, pests get into them, uh, they start eating them because they're really weak. So it's a really uh, fine, fine line yeah, and we need to know like how, how this happens and it also kind of uh, makes me think of like human development when you're like a really young child you need a lot of, you know, you need a lot of attention, you need a lot of care, you need a lot of, you know, devotion from your parents to have, at the beginning we need a supportive environment to to really actually grow because we're not necessarily fully independent yet in in what we're doing like these little seeds like uh, children they they really need the intelligence and safety and protection from their parents basically that do that for them until there's that that weird turn in the teenage <laughs> and then uh, you start to have uh, a few life lessons that you know start to kind of okay 
uh, toughen you up a little bit more and you know you need to be a little bit more self-sufficient and independent and it's the same thing for plants actually um, when these uh, th these are called cotyledons uh, the first two leaves that come out so when you you water the seeds then you have this little baby plant and they all really look the same like all the plants really look the same when they first come out they have these like, two little leaves like this boop. and these are called cotyledons and um, and then from there on uh, you, we need to calm down the water <laughs> and then give them a little bit more uh, that's and these cut cotyledons basically they're basically two, two solar panels that are just like wanting some sun and energy to grow uh, and that's how they're going to grow from now on so it's a it's a shift in their progress it's a, and we need to be attentive uh, to that yet they are still very uh, very fragile because I mean this is you know this is big like a, like a little straw you know it's a very tiny and it doesn't take much and in this big greenhouse um, I remember uh, the propagation room is where you have all the, the start the seedlings where where all the plants start and it's uh, usually warmer because uh, the seedlings need also more warmth and um, I would put my trays on the on these pipes, and uh, it was just really hot because that's where the the, the greenhouse gets its uh, its heat, and the trays would would uh, just dry up a little too much, and and uh, all the little seedlings would just dry up as well really quickly. So that also happened to me uh, many times. My boss wasn't really happy. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, because I started to understand, okay, well, there's the fungus that is starting. Well, I should probably calm down the water. They're just like rotting there. And then it went to the other extreme where they were literally drying. So I figured like, mm, I have to be really mindful with this thing because uh, it's really a, a very thin, like uh, in between line that you really want, you need to maintain basically. Um, and, and I think at the early stages of meditation, that's also, uh, that's also something that, uh, that happens a lot. At the beginning, there, there's a lot of things happening. The mind is a little bit more, uh, you know, it's not used to the meditation yet. And it can, uh, many things can take it off, the, the meditation. Many things can, uh, and we need a much more supportive environment to, uh, to grow, to grow these stages. Um, there's this um, really lovely passage that I like <clears throat> in the simile of the saw. This is Majjhima Nikaya um, 21, Kakachupa uh, Masutta. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read this uh, analogy, which is about wholesome mental development, which is what we're doing, Bhavana. Monks abandon unwholesome states and be relentless in cultivating wholesome ones. This is how you will come upon growth, increase and prosperity in this Dhamma and way of life. Monks, just as if close to a village or town, there was a great sultry grove covered with castor bean plants. Then someone would come up wanting it to live, wanting it to thrive, wanting its liberation. That person would cut down the saplings that were frail, crooked, and drawing vitality, drawing the sap. And would bring them away, completely clearing the inner grove. And that person would carefully tend to the young saplings, which were strong and upright. Then the sultry grove would quickly come to growth, increase, and prosperity. And so this is kind of the template, the blueprint of this talk tonight. Talking about how do we tend to the, the vegetation, the plants, the wholesome states that are actually nurturing our progress, that are good for us 
and to re let go and take away all the unwholesome ones that are just feeding on our like uh, like parasites on our vitality basically and bringing us down at the same time and so when we learn to tend these uh, wholesome states and bring away the unwholesome ones then there's great great happiness it's like a times two you know times two uh, winning situation win-win so uh, this is what we're gonna explore tonight and first uh, first, there needs to be, what, how do we start? Like, how do we know how to garden? We, we need wise friends, wise friends that will show us how to garden. Uh, that's how I learned to garden. Uh, some, some wise lady actually showed me how to. And um, this is how first we receive the knowledge. So the Buddha, and the Buddha obviously is uh, the, the best for this. This is our, he's our best friend. <laughs> In Pali, this is called Kalyanamitta. So beautiful friendship or virtuous friendship. And the Buddha says, the calming of mental distractions or just the calming of the mind is for one who is aware and discerning not for one who is not aware and not discerning. Aware and discerning when there are wholesome states and when there are unwholesome states. When there are unwholesome states, new distractions are produced and old distractions increase. So what we do with our attention is very important. Where do we place our mind? What do we do with our minds? When there are wholesome states, new distractions are not produced and old distractions are given up. How are distractions given up by discernment? Now first, wise friendship. Here a wise meditator visits the awakened people, learns and understands. And when I say the awakened people, this is simply a term in Pali that is called Arya Puggala, which means um, any of the four stages of awakening, basically, is uh, part of the Arya Puggalas. So that's why I call them the awakened people, but it's, this is just an English translation. Visits the awakened people, learns and understands and practices the Dhamma of the awakened people. Visits people of truth, understands and practices the Dhamma from the people of truth. That person is likely to understand what things are proper for attention and what things are improper for attention. So we need some help at the beginning. It's hard to, uh, it's hard to know all these things by ourselves. Uh, that's what it means to be a Buddha, actually. Uh, only Buddhas break through to all of this knowledge by themselves without the help of somebody else. But all of us that follow after. <laughs> Uh, we will get this from the Buddha in the first place and then trickle down to, I mean, we are 2,600 years or roughly after, after the Buddha's time. So uh, this is a lot of beautiful friendship uh, right there <laughs> that has kept this going for, for a very long time. And then this virtuous friendship, what, what do we learn from them? Well, first we need to understand that in things in the proper way, in, in the wise understanding, right view, basically, that is called samaditi. So wise friendship first brings us the right understanding, wise understanding. And what is wise understanding? Mostly it is around understanding mental states and that Wholesome states are for our own good and unwholesome states are for our detriment, basically. Here, monks, one reflects upon distractions. The, distraction, the distracted mind does not rejoice. It is not clear. It is unsettled and unliberated. Does that feel familiar? <laughs> right. Good. And... Um, Somebody could tell me any example for this? Uh, what what would, could be a distractions? What is meant here? Could it be... 
like dislike would that be would that be true yes or like uh, ang anger maybe somebody said something to you last week and now today you were thinking about it and ah like <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a common one. <laughs> Don't worry, that's universal. <laughs> Then uh, what what else could it be? Another one. That's more like a pushing away, like oh, I don't want it, like I, I don't like this person, like why did they say that to me, or no, like I don't want it. And then maybe there's a, is there like a, a the opposite movement also? Yeah. <laughs> That's a great. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. 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 And see, that comes from this this wanting, right? This wanting, this uh, the Netflix. <laughs> well, Netflix is a good hindrance in itself, <laughs> but. Um, And then when, when we get when we do it a lot, then it gets kind of built up in the mind, and we we just kind of do it automatically. We'll see that later in the retreat. We call that dependent origination. But <laughs> I, I'm going to keep it light tonight, um, just lightly touching upon these states. Um, but yeah, so aversion, not liking, not wanting, like being angry at someone, and um, or or just wanting something. Oh, I, I could really watch. Uh, What's your favorite TV show? <laughs> Nowadays, <laughs> no, show yes, on. yes. Mm. Uh, okay. I would say back in the day, I liked uh, Prison Break. Prison Break. That was pretty good. All right. Yeah. They always got out. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a, very good. <laughs> Breaking, breaking free. That's the name of the sutta, by the way. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, that was great. Um, didn't expect that. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so yeah. And the, the that angry mind. How does it feel? It's like, yeah, right, huh? It's not. It it doesn't settle. It doesn't want to, it, how do you feel when you're angry? It's not, you can't calm down. You can't, you can't be composed. Like a drug addict. Like a drug addict. Yes, 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 very much. And when you really want something also, it's really kind of, uh, sometimes it gets like a obsessive a little bit, huh? <laughs> On different scales, different level, obviously, yes. I'm not saying that everybody here is like a, <laughs> um, but the mind is kind of a, it's not happy here and now it's not just content like it's not it, it just like it leans towards uh, it wants something so that's why just to take a moment and to realize this to bring this into our mind and to our hearts like oh right like this is so true like this anger is so It's so agitated. It's 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 like boiling from inside. It's not. It's really not fun. And then constantly wanting things at at some point. Like I was really good at that. Uh, <laughs> just to make up for my my comment on obsessiveness. But <laughs> uh, I was really good at always wanting, wanting, wanting more, more, more. And then at some point, well, all you're doing is wanting more. Whatever you get, it's never enough. So it's it's like, uh, well, what's the point? You know, uh, I just want to be happy. Everybody, that's, you know, there's one law in the universe that everybody wants to be happy. Period. I mean, nobody wakes up in the morning. Oh, I really feel like feeling terrible today. That would be great. No, no, no. <laughs> that's that's not how it works. So everybody wants to be happy, but it's just sometimes we, we don't know, we're not seeing it properly. And that's the wisdom of the Buddha. That's so profound. And this is what this wise understanding is, is all about. 
And by the way, this is completely related to the Four Noble Truths. I've, I've been talking about the Four Noble Truths for the past 10 minutes, basically. So understanding what is causing us problems, what is, us, what is causing us uh, trouble. I know you, you've probably heard the word suffering a lot in Buddhism. I personally stay away from that word. Um, when I think suffering, I see like a slice of bacon in a pan, basically. And that's just like searing, kind of. Uh, so the word dukkha means unpleasant. It doesn't mean suffering. It, like the word sukkha means pleasant. The word, the word dukkha means unpleasant. There's, don't worry, there's a lot of words in Pali that can translate it as suffering. <laughs> but um, I just personally, I, I just think it's a, it's a little bit intense uh, when, when we, we use these terms. Uh, sometimes it, it, it turns the, the teaching a little bit pessimistic sometimes, it makes it sound a little negative. And the Buddha's teaching is like probably the furthest thing from uh, being negative. So, so basically, the Four Noble Truths are what I call the, the four uh, understandings of the awakened ones, because this, in Pali, this is Arya Satcha, basically. Uh, is about understanding what is causing us problems, what, in us, what is causing us trouble, understanding where it comes from, and then getting rid of it. <laughs> Letting it go, changing it to something and releasing it into something that is wholesome, that is beneficial, that is, I mean, what could the end of trouble could mean, the end of suffering uh, could mean, if not happiness, right? So we use these terms, uh, Pali, unfortunately, Pali is quite, quite, Interestingly, it's quite negative, like there's a lot of negation in it, like not, like neither perception nor non-perception kind of thing. So if you're familiar with, uh, with these terms a little bit, you... so sometimes when, when we take the Pali, just literally it, it can sound a little negative, but what we're talking about is how to be happy, really. But not to be happy in in any kind of way, you know, and not to be happy, like looking for happiness in the senses, in sensory gratification, looking for happiness in wisdom, in wholesome states, wholesome mental development. Because happiness is a state of mind. It's not something that you buy. It cannot be bought. Whatever you're gonna buy, you can be happy buying it or not. Um, that's your choice and here we learn to be happy all the time without any other thing so uh, this is what we're doing and this is wise understanding then one reflects upon letting go and mental upliftment the mind that is uplifted and that lets go it rejoices it is clear it is settled and liberated so when you're happy, when you're joyful, when everything is going well in your mind, basically whatever the external causes are, how do you feel? Do you feel like you need something? Do you feel like, uh, do you feel agitated? No, not really. It's really easy to be present, to be here, to be content when we're happy, when the mind is uplifted. It's synonymous with presence of mind, with being here. So when we understand these things, we don't need to force the mind to be here. <laughs> we just uplift the mind and it's here and it's present and we let go of the rest. So that's, a, that's the actual practice. Moreover, the mind that is happy is well developed elevated, emancipated, and completely unshackled from distractions. In this way, one becomes liberated from the obsessive and oppressive mental movements arisen from all distractions. And one does not experience those, those distractions any longer. 
This is said to be the breaking free from mental distractions. And these distractions are really, the more, more we will go deeper into this practice, you will see how these, these, uh, these distractions are really kind of like a obsessive uh, behaviors of the mind. And, they're, uh, and they come with a lot of, they come with a lot of tension. They come with uh, uh, rigidity. Now we understand that Wholesome states are for our benefit and unwholesome ones are, are not. Now there are certain things, like I said, the Buddha always started with the coarser um, and then moved towards the finer. So basically body and up to mind, body, speech and mind, basically. And here, now uh, there are some things that we need to do uh, in order to you know, there are a lot of things that also want to eat our garden. <laughs> One thing that you learn when you're gardening is that <laughs> there's a lot of animals out there that also want to eat the same thing that you're going to grow. <laughs> so we need to fence our garden. So we want to protect what we have already. And this is a bit the role of the virtues. And now we're starting to go deeper into uh, right effort, wise wise practice and this is fourfold the first one is to protect the second one is to uh, let go the third one is to bring up and the fourth is to maintain so protect uh, the mind from unwholesome states second is letting go of unwholesome states that are already existing or already arising then bringing up, like consciously, willfully bringing up and consciously conjuring wholesome states in our minds and then maintaining them, cultivating them. <clears throat> and so this fencing the garden is very important because um, there are certain things that we can do in life that can really injure us and if we don't do them then we're really protected we're protecting our mind uh, and these are very coarse actions and these are the virtues that we take every morning and this is from another sutta that i'm uh, quoting then one abandons harming living beings one holds back from it one abandons stealing one holds back from it one abandons unskillful sexual relations, one holds back from it. One abandons speaking lies, one holds back from it. One abandons taking, talking in others' back, one holds back from it. One abandons coarse language, one holds back from it. And so this is kind of setting a perimeter in our life where uh, we're just basically protecting our garden. Whatever uh, un unskillful <laughs> things that could want to be going into our garden and digging up what we, what we started to grow, then at least we're protected from the, the, bigger, the bigger animals. And now, we, uh, once our garden is nicely... Um, nicely delimited with a fence and protected now we want to add a little bit of fertilizer <laughs> because um, well where I'm from in Canada uh, we have very uh, very harsh winters and uh, you know the, the the ground in the springtime is very hard and packed because it's been pressed down by the snow and then it's been very cold and so first first we want to kind of like loosen up the dirt, till the ground, and, uh, and then put in some fertilizer. Then this virtuous seeker, void of longing, void of impatience, uninfatuated, fully conscious, and continually present, right? always with your ob object of meditation, your spiritual friend, meditates with a heart filled with love, suffusing one direction, a second, a third, and a fourth. Thus above, below, and everywhere across to all living beings in this boundless universe. One meditates with a heart filled with boundless love, vast, expansive, measureless, 
free from anger and impatience. Imagine a mighty conch blower who could effortlessly let his sound be known to the four directions. In the same way, chief, he's speaking to a, a chief. <laughs> this is another uh, sutta. In the same way, chief, when the release of mind by boundless love is developed and cultivated, any previous selfish actions cannot remain, it cannot stay. And this is the beautiful power of loving kindness. And now, of course, this is to all directions, to all living beings, vast, expansive, measureless. This is the way that the Buddha taught mostly. Uh, we're going to get there. Now the spiritual friend is like the seed right now that you're growing. Uh, you're t attending to the spiritual friend. And slowly it will start to take root because we're also loosening up the ground. We're loosening up the ground with release and relax. And so the, the soil is starting to be a little bit more malleable and the little rootlets of these wholesome states, they can actually take hold a little easier, but it takes a little bit of time. <laughs> so we have to keep going and keep going. And the beautiful power of uh, boundless love or metta or loving kindness is exactly this, as the Buddha mentions it so eloquently here. When there is loving kindness in your heart, and you're fully dedicated to it, there are no unwholesome states there. It's the opposite of anger. It's the opposite of all these unwholesome states that you could uh, have. And just by placing this loving kindness in your heart, it's actually purifying your whole mind, clearing the whole slate, like he says here. This is... Uh, Pamana kamma, like limited karma in the mind. Like limited karma means selfish karma, selfish actions, uh, anger, jealousy, all these, these limited things, these small, these things that make us small, that box our mind in, that do not allow it to reach full bloom, basically. Uh, they cannot take root. They cannot take root in a heart that is filled with love, basically. So... And, I mean, there's so much more to say about this, but there's another sutta where the Buddha explains 11 benefits of the loving-kindness. And uh, it is also a protection for yourself. If you are 100% dedicated to metta, maitri, to loving-kindness, um, it is said that uh, uh, no, no blade or poison or whatever can happen uh, that could harm you uh, this cannot happen if you're fully dedicated to it and the devas protect you <laughs> so so it's a good uh, good life insurance just just letting you in on this one <laughs> so no need for a lot of money for life insurance you can just practice metta <laughs> and you're all set <laughs> but you ha you have to do it you have to do it fully and another thing that the Buddha said uh, in this particular sutta on the, 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 the Metta Nisangsa Sutta, is the, the benefits of loving kindness, basically, is that uh, the mind quickly enters samadhi. Tuvatang chittang. Samadhi ati. Yeah, probably samadhi ati, but I'm not sure. This one, this is a little bit different. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, I'll have to look my Pali sources again. I'm sorry. Um, but it, it, it is the only place uh, that I found so far that the Buddha expressively mentions that loving kindness, uh, especially loving kindness, brings the mind quickly to collectedness, to a collected state. He doesn't say that about any of the other objects of meditation. Not that I've uh, ever encountered uh, the, the suttas and I've uh, control F the whole canon about it so you <laughs> so I do that a lot <laughs> when I want to know how much it's like the Buddha says something I just control F and then 
type it in and see how many times it comes up. And that one is just this the only one I could find, actually. So it's quite really interesting. And now the fertilizer and the loving kindness and the cleansing also of the mind uh, and heart. And what about some sunshine now? What about if we were to uh, bring some sunshine of awareness to all of this? And how does awareness shine? How does awareness come about? Well, as we talked earlier, um, wholesome states like love, compassion, joy, mudita, upekka, steadiness of mind, balance of mind, these states all come with awareness. We don't need to force awareness when these states are there. It comes with it. It's part of the package. That's, that's the wisdom of the Buddha. You don't need to force it. And so as long as these states are there, there will be awareness, there will be mindfulness. What, what pulls us out of there are distractions, agitation, anger, anything, impatience. And how does this awareness come about? How does the mind get this kind of, you know, this, this awareness even more? Because in the six R's or in this practice, we talk about the loving kindness. First, we bring up the loving kindness, but we also talk about joy, smiling. And so here for you, this is um, how the Buddha explained the, how this process works. When one properly undertakes a subject for mental collectedness, they properly attend to it, properly understand it. Just as I, as I told you, it's not about forcing, it's about understanding what these states are and choosing the right states, basically. And master them by discernment, and that's the discernment there. Then they directly experience the meaning of those teachings, directly experience the Dhamma. So when we know which states are beneficial, then we understand, we practice them, and then we understand directly here and now. Then gladness arises. With this gladness comes joy. With the joyful mind, the body calms down. With a calm body, one knows happiness. One's happy mind then becomes collected. So this is what we're going to be repeating every morning in the puja, first thing. Um, and this is very important to understand. Um, there are other suttas where the Buddha um, will say this sequence right after the sequence of loving-kindness, basically just bringing up loving-kindness, we can understand, wow, I'm happy here and now, and the mind becomes glad, and the mind becomes uplifted by joy, and then the body calms down, and then the mind becomes very happy and still and collected. And so this is the sunshine, this is how awareness also trickle in. I call it the pooling of awareness, basically. It's by slowly letting go of everything else and cultivating these wholesome states, like a big umbrella, kind of upside down, that is like a very, very broad and wide and it catches like all the awareness and it starts to pool in. Like all these leaves, you see these leaves, um, all the trees and the plants, usually, uh, they, you can see it's, al it's almost, uh, almost all of them are made to catch water. Um, it's, it's a bit like this, and then, um, and then it's all made to kind of trickle to the stem, and then fall on the stem, and then follow the stem and go down to the roots, basically. And that's what we're basically doing also. So slowly, slowly. Tura, tura. Dire, dire. I found this, uh, this really nice uh, quote from, uh, from Bruce Lee, actually, on Right Effort. And so he says, uh, Choose the positive. You have a choice. You are master of your attitude. Choose the positive, the constructive. Optimism is a faith that leads to success. And I thought that was great. <laughs> I was like, I think I'll put it in, just good old Bruce Lee in there. So basically, that's exactly what we're doing. Every time there's a distraction, we're choosing. We're choosing the positive. We're choosing to let go, let go of the distraction and to bring up love again, to bring up a smile again. And that will rewire your whole 
mind that will um, um, I, and I like his uh, optimism is a is a faith is a faith that leads to success um, I think like this is a really good definition of Buddhism <laughs> that that faith that leads to happiness basically because it's very uh, it's about choosing the right states of mind that you want to cultivate. And success is, it's only in your mind. Success is like happiness. It's a, it's a mental state. When, when you learn to see and cultivate these states in, in your mind and in your heart, you'll be successful at everything that you're doing. You'll be happy in everything. So that's exactly what, uh, what our friend Bruce Lee is saying here. Some people have, uh, have doubts about the smiling, and I thought I would bring in some, uh, <laughs> some studies in there. I'm looking at you because you're the science, you're the science guy. Yeah, but, I'm uh, reading it. I've read the same studies. <laughs> yeah, oh, good. <laughs> good. Have you ever heard of, uh, of this hypothesis, the facial feedback hypothesis, uh, which... Uh, brought forward that uh, facial expressions, but not only facial expressions, physical expression, physical movements, but when we mimic the same movements uh, as certain emotions, we also kind of trigger the brain in the same way as these emotions. Like if you frown your eyebrows and um, make tight lips and go like make a, like a sour face, if you do that for a while, then it actually will get to your brain, and it will your brain will start thinking you're 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 sad and you're you're kind of like well you're kind of sour face. But <laughs> and then it's the same thing if you smile. If you smile and you have an open uh, open glow and uh, you you're you're smiling from your eyes also, uh, what is what's called a Duchenne smile, like a a real genuine smile is called a Duchenne smile. Usually, uh, is because the, the the corners of your mouth are up, but also the corners of your eyes. That's how you can tell a fake smile from a real smile. <laughs> you know, a contemptuous smile is more like, "Hmm, I'm really happy for you." <laughs> Not true. <laughs> <laughs> but a real smile is really genuine. That it will raise the corner, not just the zygomatic major, but the acili. I can't remember the name of that muscle. <laughs> but so both muscles have to be engaged. And if you if you do it, then um, the hypothesis started with with uh, Charles Darwin, uh, but. <clears throat> It also brought, got brought further, and uh, one, one study that got, got made was, uh, what's the name of it? Emotional Faces and Biomotion Studies. Is that the one? The, the pencil study? Yes, yes, the pencil study, okay. yeah. So basically, they studied, uh, they had uh, two groups of people, and they, they made a study where they would put a pen. Do I have a pen? they would put a pen in the mouth of people like this. And um, they would ask questions, how do they interpret movements from other people? And it's, uh, your face looks happier when I smile. I think it's the name of the, anyways, of the paper. And so basically they would, uh, they, the first group would do this. That's all. And then the second group would do this. <laughs> and I mean that there's, I mean there's, there's nothing you know there's nothing um, more than than this, and it's just it was they were just trying to find the most neutral way that they could to mimic these these facial expressions, and then they noted they had the little quiz, and then they asked people to note how you know how people move like. Do they look happy or did they, they, they look sad? And the people that had the pen like this uh, saw reality in a much more happy way. And that's what the study came with. And so it's also called fake it till you make it. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So we really put a huge emphasis on smiling because it's true. Uh, you will see um, the more you smile on this retreat, you will start to feel it in your mind. It really does work. It'll start to get to you after a few days, you'll see. <laughs> And uh, you should smile uh, so much that people s should look at you and be like, who's that crazy person over there? <laughs> Just like smiling all over the place. <laughs> and, um, and you'll see it's, it's really beautiful after a while. And some people, you know, they complain, like, oh, yeah, it's, it's just hurting, you know, like I don't want to smile anymore. And it's like, well... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, do you, do you notice? <laughs> How, how's your mind now? So smile again. Don't take your mind so seriously. And you'll see it will get to you. It will, get, it will become uplifted more and more. And then now we've, we've seen the, the fertilizing, the preparing the ground and uh, bringing up how, how to grow. And the spiritual friend is like the seed now. You have the seed and you're starting to grow it. And... Uh, we also talk about release and uh, the I like to always bring it back to the source uh, where uh, where we take this in the suttas and the the, the source there is is in a, the same sutta called all the distractions where the Buddha says reflecting wisely when a distraction comes up one does not continue along with it so not not feeding your attention into it one abandons it, releases it, lets it go. One undoes it and brings it to an end. And so release is much more mental. We're not f stopping feeding our attention to the distractions. There's two parts of this process, and that's why I was saying release is mental and relaxing is physical. And I also, um, I really like to, to put a lot of emphasis on this because this is probably one of the most important part of this technique or practice. Mentally letting go of distractions is not enough, especially nowadays we spend so much time in our minds. We think we let go, but we're not really because we don't really know how we have to go through the body because otherwise it's not complete. It's not a full letting go. And this is, this is something that is uh, nowadays talked a lot about. I'm not, no, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of somatic experiencing, right? Yes, there's some, some nodding, yes. Uh, somatic experiencing is the venerable? No, okay, Peter Levine. And um, he, it's, a, it's a practice where uh, people that have a huge trauma accumulated uh, uh, like a, a very severe degree uh, will will be asked to to go back into their bodies a lot of body work a lot of body awareness like how does that feel when they have like a spasm or whatever it is uh, to to go back into the body and leave the realm of the mind because the mind it won't settle if you try to just fix the mind with the mind it doesn't work that well so we need to go back through the body the Buddha called the body, uh, body awareness kind of like the anchor, like a, like a post in the ground. So this is a really amazing way of grounding the mind, in a sense. Certain nerves or certain functions of the body, but one of them is the vagus nerve. Have you heard of the vagus nerve? Who said? Yes. yes. Oh, very good. Haha, <laughs> very good. A lot of trauma um, treatment nowadays is really going back into the body and uh, not necessarily going to try to solve what your problems are or your trauma is by uh, just talking to you and going in, in the mind and trying to fix like, the, me the, the mental problem. They will go right into the body because uh, we store all of this trauma into our bodies. Whatever has happened to us that was traumatic or that was really intense, we keep it in our bodies, basically. And to release it fully is... Now, there's more and more studies that prove that and more and more methods that come around it, is that by going through the body, we actually are allowed to um, go to the root of it and release it, and, and it becomes very efficient. 
And the vagus nerve is uh, one of the, so I know there's a very, some very knowledgeable people in the room, so I'm, I'll be careful what I say. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not like a um, um, medical doctor or anything, but uh, there are uh, different kinds of nerves in, in the body, and uh, the vagus nerve happens to be uh, a nerve that sends information not from the brain to the body, but from the body to the brain. And so when we activate the vagus nerve in certain ways, and uh, I have an exercise for you uh, if you'd like to try right now. Um, basically, just put your hand on top of your head. and tilt your head slightly towards your and look up like this not overdoing it but you should feel a slight a slight stretch in your neck and really looking up And we're going to hold this maybe for 30 seconds, 40 seconds. And just relax. And at some point, as you relax, You might feel a kind of a, a general relaxing of your intestines and abdomen. Maybe all of a sudden you feel like whew, it goes down and you can breathe deeper. And slowly coming back up and doing the same thing with the other side. Looking up. Okay, and slowly bring it back. A little bit dizzy, that's okay. Did you feel it? Did you feel something kind of letting go in your abdomen? No. Sometimes it takes a couple of try, <laughs> a couple of times uh, on each side. But basically what this does is, this is one of the exercises that you can do to um, kind of stimulate the vagus nerve. And it basically tells physically from your body to your brain to relax, basically, to let go. And actually the, the body, uh, by just doing that movement, it will, it will settle the, the mind and so the body as well. So it's really interesting to, to realize um, this really intimate connection between the body and the mind. But this is kind of like a preliminary or an introduction because I think that the Buddha really uh, also tapped into that knowledge of Nama Rupa and the really intimate connection. He, he, he knew that. And, you know, this is a, just a glimpse of a meditation instruction that he gave really often, like one of his most uh, common 
common meditation instructions, and that's part of the anapanasati, uh, mindfulness of breathing, what is known as mindfulness of breathing, or the satipatthana sutta. It's just a brief two lines I will say. It's like one trains to experience the whole body, one trains to calm the tension in the body. So he knew that by calming the tension in the body, the mind also settles. And so now we've seen pretty much all the six R's. And you've seen where we take them from in the suttas. So that's really interesting. So uh, from the Satipatthana or the Anapanasati, we take Bhante Vimal Ramsey, my teacher, took the relaxed step. Yes. And so we've seen the six R's. We've seen where we take them from in the suttas directly. So that's really interesting. I thought I would uh, offer this. And then the release step is... Uh, found in the, uh, well, in many places, but really clearly in the uh, number two of Majjhima Nikaya, uh, all the distractions. Uh, and obviously the loving kindness uh, is, is one of the most common also uh, meditation instructions that the Buddha gave. Mm, I can't remember the number, but the, the amount of time that the Buddha gave the instructions of, on loving kindness and the Brahma Viharas is actually far more than Anapana, actually, um, uh, quite a bit more. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really central to, to the teaching. It's not, uh, it's not just a side dish kind of practice that we just like, oh yeah, I'll do a 10 day retreat and do 10 minutes of metta at the end. <laughs> this is a, the whole, like, uh, probably uh, the highway in which uh, the Buddha nudged most of people that started on the path because it's so quick, it cleans the mind so thoroughly and uh, well uh, and quickly that it, because of its potency, uh, that it just brings people really quickly, really far. Um, and then we talk about the smiling and... Uh, <clears throat> the sequence of natural samadhi, natural collectedness, how the happy mind, the uplifted mind comes, becomes collected. So this is really like a unpacking the six R's, unpacking right effort, wise practice. And um, now now's the quiz time. Can somebody tell me the six R's? <laughs> yes. Release, yes. Oh, good. Re smile. Return. Re repeat. Return to what? Love. Love. Ah, using my words too. I like it. Very good. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Great. Okay, now quiz is over. Everybody passed. <laughs> check, check. <laughs> And as we do this, now the, the garden starts to grow, and this is what we call jhana. And this is when the meditation starts. And at, I, I love in Hindi, this is really close, jhan, jhan, right? I'm not mistaking, jhan, right? And so jhan, jhana, that simply means meditation. And the Buddha taught there are many levels of meditation. I'm not gonna go into this tonight. It will be another talk later. But the first level of meditation, uh, which I will mention here, because I just want to, everybody to know how this garden starts to grow. This is the first little shoot that comes out. Uh, that's what we can notice as wholesome states start, start to pick up. Letting go of all sensory engagement and letting go of all unwholesome states. So as you 6R return to your, your spiritual friend, then, then that will start to get steadier and steadier and that you're letting go of all the distractions, all the hindrances. Still attended by thinking and imagining, you, you still be able to wish your friend well, um, to picture your friend in your mind or uh, to picture a, a place or a time you were happy. That's still possible. With the blissful happiness born of letting go, viveka jang piti sukkang. So this, this is when we start to really enjoy. Now there's a little bit of joy that arises naturally. 
just from the meditation. And that's the source, that's the well that's starting to grow, that's starting to go deeper a little bit and the water is starting to well up a little bit more. One understands and abides in the first level of meditation. So that's the first level of meditation. It's really, you know, there's still thinking, there's still this imagination, that activity of the mind that is possible, but there's this joy from letting go of the hindrances, and that's quite notable. You'll notice at some point you'll feel more joy arising, and that's good, that's good. And of course, the smiling is, you know, really going to help you keep smiling all the time. You, should, you shouldn't stop. <laughs> I like to see this word virya, which is translated as effort in the Buddhist teaching a lot. Uh, personally, I really like to see it as devotion, maybe because, uh, I don't know, it's like, um, maybe because I was a bhakti before, but uh, <laughs> um, it's, this, it's not this element of strength or forcing or necessarily effort, it's this element of dedication of being fully devoted to wholesome states. Because if you force it, it's actually not going to work. It's like me when I was trying to overwater my little plants and they all wilted and they, they all died and fungus got into them. Um, if we try too hard, and that's the same thing with meditation, if we try too hard, we put too much effort into this, we're just going to drown our practice. It's not going to work. We need to also kind of be able to take a step back and actually enjoy. And so this is, uh, this is another thing that can happen is people putting too much effort, too much effort into, and strength into really, you know, like, mm, I really love you, <laughs> which I mean, great, but <laughs> we also need to, as we go deeper in this meditation, we also will need to learn to soften. To, to learn to go deeper. And this is a little story. Um, I forgot to grab the, the, the author's name, but I take this from a person I really admire who is a really good teacher of our tradition, Doug Craft. And I will be reading a, a Venerable's child story when he was going to bed uh, in the evening. Yes. <laughs> so this is The Garden by... Uh, Stories of a frog and toad. Frog was in his garden. Toad came walking by. What a fine garden you have, frog, he said. Yes, said frog, it is very nice, but it was hard work. I wish I had a garden, said toad. Here are some flower seeds, plant them in the ground, said frog, and soon you will have a garden too. How soon? asked Toad. Quite soon, said Frog. Toad ran home. He planted the flower seeds. Now seeds, said Toad, start growing. Toad walked up and down a few times. The seeds did not start to grow. Toad put his head close to the ground and said loudly, now seeds start growing. Toad looked at the ground again. The seeds did not start to grow. Toad put his head very close to the ground and shouted, Now seeds start growing. Frog came running up the path. What's all that noise? he asked. My seeds will not grow, said Toad. You're shouting too much, said Frog. These poor seeds are afraid to grow. My seeds are afraid to grow? asked Toad. Of course, said Frog. Leave them alone for a few days. Let the sun shine on them. Let the rain fall on them. Soon your, se your seeds will start to grow. That night, Toad looked out his window. Drat, said Toad, my seeds have not started to grow. They must be afraid of the darts. 
Toad went out to his garden with some candles. I will read the seeds a story, said Toad. Then they will not be afraid. Toad read a long story to his seeds. All the next day, Toad sang songs to his seeds. All the next day, Toad read poems to his seeds. And all the next day, Toad played music for his seeds. Toad looked at the ground. The seeds did not start to grow. What shall I do, cried Toad. These must be the most frightened seeds in the whole world. Then Toad fell very tired, and he fell asleep. Toad, Toad, wake up, said Frog. Look at your garden. Toad looked at his garden. Little green plants were coming up of the ground. At last, shouted Toad, my seeds have stopped being afraid to grow. And now you will have a nice garden too, said Frog. Yes, said Toad, but you were right, Frog. It was hard work. So on this, um, continue to have fun, continue to enjoy your practice like Thich Nhat Hanh at the very beginning. And you'll see you won't have to put any kind of effort or force it, it will just happen naturally. I hope you have a beautiful evening. I will recite this in Pali first and we will say it in English afterwards all together. Dukkha patta chani dukkha bhaya patta chani bhaya soka patta chani soka hontu sabbe pipani no idam no punyang sabbe sapta no modantu sabba sampatti siddhiya aga satta cha bhumatta Devanaga Mahitika Punyang Tanganu Moritva Chirang Rakantu Sambuddha Sasana. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.